Welcome to the Impact Learning Visionaries podcast, where we celebrate the unsung heroes of the learning and development industry. As always, we'll be bringing some laughter and a bit of fun along the way, but more importantly, you'll get some incredible insights, key lessons, and unique perspectives on everything related and possibly unrelated to training and development. Let's get this show on the road. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Impact Learning Visionaries podcast. Today, I'm excited to have Andrew McNeil join us, who is an accomplished author, senior leader with over two decades of experience in project leadership. He is co-founder of LX Leaders, who specialize in leadership training, coaching, and consultancy, who center on a pragmatic approach that ensures leaders and employers are engaged and empowered to do their best work. Andrew is also the author of an incredible book called Organizational Mindfulness, A How-To Guide, and we're definitely going to be exploring that today. It's written from his own personal experience and sets out what mindfulness is, why you might apply it to your organization, and how you can apply it. Andrew, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Jason. Great to be here. So let's let's start with this concept of mindfulness, and um, and um, it's it's obviously something that I have come across many times. But but maybe for the benefit of everybody listening, let's just kind of start with what is mindfulness, and and why should we care? Yeah, thanks. Well, mindfulness is described in in lots of ways by lots of people, but the definition which I particularly like is John Kabat-Zinn's definition, uh, which is, and I'm going to paraphrase down and people might know if I get this wrong, but it is uh, present, non-judgmental present moment awareness. And I love that sentence because it's so packed. Um, and, and what I think he's describing there is being aware of what's happening right now, not wanting it to be something else, but just bringing your attention to what's happening right now. And that's uh, a definition for me, which is very helpful because if we apply it instantly, we can think if anybody who's listening to this has ever had their mind run away with the possible consequences of what might be, then having the capacity to let go of that and bring our attention back to what's actually happening now can be incredibly powerful in the brain. Um, yeah, I mean, and in future, I think when you've got quotes like that, you know, to and you're worried about paraphrasing. Yoda voice generally, you know, makes a big difference. Um, so just encourage that in future. That is, so um, and it, it it does actually sound very much like the type of advice that Yoda <laughs> might give a young Jedi. Um, so how I mean, in in organisations today, I mean, uh, there's there's a lot of people who are talking about mindfulness. Um, and and a lot of people talk about it from the perspective of um, almost this kind of concept of of stress management, concept of kind of self awareness, the concept of vulnerability, showing up to your full self, you know, all of these different kind of aspects. Where where do you see this concept of mindfulness kind of of you know, having the biggest impact in organisations? Um, yeah, yeah. I, I think you know everything that you've just described. Yes, you know the 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 capacity to be present uh, and to be uh, can be really helpful in in our well being. But if I'm if, the way that I look at mindfulness in an organisational context is to kind of present what we do now. So my background is in project leadership. And projects have boards in them. Now, it doesn't have to be a project board. It could be an executive board. It could be a team meeting. Whatever kind of organizational meeting you have, it could be the local parents' teachers association. We have these meetings. What are they actually supposed to do? What, what, what are they supposed to achieve? Well, my argument is that they're, they're designed to achieve shared, present, non-judgmental awareness. Because what we're supposed to be doing, certainly in a project board, is we, we turn up, we bring our full attention to complex issues, we try to leave our prejudgment at the door, and we come to a considered view, and then collectively decide what the right actions should be. So for me, a program board is an exercise in shared 
present non-judgmental awareness. But we get it wrong. We get it wrong all the time. Because in most, well, a lot of boards that I see, people are on their phones. They're replying to emails. They're replying to texts. If they're not doing that, then actually their mind is in the last conversation that they had. Maybe that didn't go well. Maybe they're thinking about their kids going off to school. Maybe one of them's ill. Maybe they're thinking about the next meeting that they're going through and the stressful presentation that they're going to have to give. Wherever their head is at, it may well not be in the room. And I put my hands up to the fact that my head's often not in the room myself. It's very hard. It takes a lot of skill and discipline to actually bring your attention back to be in the room. So my, my sense of how we can apply mindfulness in organizations is to say, we've designed organizations, an organizational ritual, if you like, to, to, to give it that phrase, in, in a way to try to achieve this idea of shared present moment awareness. We just don't do it very well. So if we introduce mindfulness at an organizational level as well as at an ind individual level, yes, we can have all those benefits around well-being, which are well, well um, proven and well shown. Uh, in lots of research, but we can also actually empower our our organizations to be more present and for us then to make better decisions and more collegiate decisions, including mm -hmm. communicating with each other more effectively. Which which I think is is obviously um, you know one of those pesky soft skills that people are realizing are more and more um, significant in organizations today. Um, and I guess the question, the next question for me is, you know, what does it look like when when you kind of get mindfulness right? Like, what are the types of impacts and benefits you start to see on the organization? Great question. So, two quotes, I think, which maybe sum it up. Uh, introduced uh, mindfulness. Uh, in a number of different ways in a complex program which was dealing with a very high stress environment and one of the directors who left just before me said that the senior team was the most collegiate that they had ever experienced and they put that down to mindfulness i thought that was a really interesting piece of feedback the other uh, quote was somebody saying it's very evident that the senior team take well-being seriously so I think on a practical level, and I could give you lots of examples where I think the meetings went better or people were more attentive. I didn't have a control group, so it's very hard to say that we actually got better outcomes. But in terms of what did it achieve in contract, concrete sense, certainly because I was in the senior team, there was a sense of collegiateness, support, shared experience. And that wasn't just me feeling that. Mm -hmm. And uh, in terms of how uh, how the whole team was affected. I think it sent messages about how well-being, all the uh, items which you were listing at the start, were important to the senior team. So we were taking it seriously for ourselves, and so other people should take it seriously within their organisations, their element of the organisation. Yeah, and I guess well-being is one of those one of those types of skills which probably starts with the, the individual outward. Um, and and probably needs a, an element of of self awareness um, to to first obviously know that the benefits of mindfulness, but then know that ultimately you as the individual probably need to make the first step. Um, and I I guess the question in that is, you know, you, you kind of presented this example of where you're sitting in a meeting, then we kind of either thinking about what happened in the previous meeting, or we're thinking about you know kind of the fact that we left the washing machine on at home and we're not present in that session. How do you, I mean, how do you build up those micro habits? How do you check yourself and how do you actually know I'm not being very mindful right now? I'm not really present. Well, uh, again, to share a thought from personal experience, when I first started practicing mindfulness, I happened to spend some time with friends uh, who I knew had a practice and I'd been recommended uh, to go on this uh, weekend retreat in order to learn about it uh, by one of these friends. And this this guy that I didn't know very well said, so, Andrew, how was it? How was it? And I said, to be honest with you, if that's how busy my mind is, how do I ever get anything done? And I thought that they were going to look at me and say, 
Andrew, you're not a well bunny, are you? But bless them, to their credit, they said, yeah, everybody feels like that at the start. And I thought that was really interesting. So, so the reason why I'm telling you that story is I didn't realize that I had such an unhealthy relationship to my thoughts or indeed that I had so many of them. I think I just had this sort of background noise going on and when I had a thought, it was kind of, well, that's me, isn't it? So I've got to act on that. I've got to do this. And it, it, there was obviously filters, thank goodness, but there, the the awareness of what my thoughts were like or how many of them I was having, I, it just ha I hadn't brought my attention to it. Mm. So when I first brought my attention to it, it was kind of like, whoa, you know, there's a lot going on there, isn't it? So gradually over not a huge amount of time, I'd say sort of three to six months of practicing every day for a short period of time, I kind of got used to then noticing, oh, here's a thought. Hello, there's that one. Oh, there's fear. Oh, there's self-doubt. Oh, there... And just getting used to, oh, I recognize some of these and, and maybe letting them pass. There's this lovely expression uh, that we can look at thoughts as if they are leaves on a stream. And the idea is that you can either sit on the riverbank and you can watch your thoughts go by, or you can jump on board one of these thoughts. And if you do, you see the whole world from the perspective of that thought. But if you stay on the riverbank, you can watch the thought go by. So, so how do we build up that capacity? The first thing I think is to notice that thoughts are a thing, that you could actually have a different relationship to your thoughts. And then by practice, you can develop the skill of noticing your thoughts and letting your thoughts go by. And then over time, what I was doing was bringing this into day-to-day -day practice in work. So one of the things which I found quite good fun, a little bit of ninja practice, was uh, not quite Jedi. Well, maybe Jedi. Uh, I would stand outside. Same thing. Same thing. Same thing. Yeah. So I, <laughs> I, I, you know that moment in a meeting it's just after the weekend and everybody's showing off about how great their weekend was. Or if it's the end of the week, they're saying what a brilliant weekend they're going to have. Well, in those moments, everybody's pumping up their adrenaline. So they're really hyped. So they get into that meeting and they're really charged and there's all this energy. And I would sit there and I'd do a very, very gentle, quiet practice. Nobody knew I was doing it. I was just bringing my attention to the breath or bringing my attention to the feet on the floor just for two or three minutes. So then when I went into the meeting, everybody else is really wired on adrenaline and I'm just sitting there quietly and my brain's able to work. So as well as starting what you might describe as the sort of gym work of, you know, a, a friend of mine says, you know, I don't go to the gym to be brilliant at leg presses. What I go to the gym to do is to be able to lift a wheelbarrow or carry heavy loads. And 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 this is my experience too. I mm. Not that I go to the gym, but, you know, it, it it's... You don't do the practice just because of the practice. Now, I would argue that with meditation and mindfulness, it's a little bit different from that. There is an intrinsic value to it, but it definitely does build up this, this muscle, this capacity to notice your thoughts. And then learning some simple techniques, which we introduced through LX Leaders for leaders. Um, when, you, when you introduce those techniques into the day job, into the lived experience in the office, it can be a game changer. Mm. Sure, there's, there's about 475 questions that just came through that, that little section. But um, one thing stuck into my head is, is when you were talking about, you know, kind of having a different relationship with our thoughts. Um, I recently, and this may have nothing at all whatsoever to do with this conversation, but it, it did pop into my head, so I'm going to say it, is I, I heard something fascinating recently. And, and the reason that, that I'm saying this is because like you, I have a very active mind and I I almost have, you know, those kind of movies where someone affects a timeline and then there's like a spread, like a myriad of different kind of, of eventualities that come out of a change to a timeline. That's in a degree how my mind works. Um, I, I am probably an overanalyzer, overthinker, and I like to think of all the different scenarios and, and I have these incredible dialogues going on in my head. Now, recently I've heard that more than half the people in the world don't actually have an inner dialogue, which I found fascinating because I thought 
Well, I mean, if you don't have an inner dialogue, then mindfulness must be quite easy because you're not getting in your own way. <laughs> so for half the world, maybe they've cracked this mindfulness thing and if the rest of us are struggling to catch up. It's, um, but yeah, for me, that's, that's, I guess, part of the challenge is, is I think, honestly, I mean, I've, I've read a lot about mindfulness and I've, I mean, one of my all time favorite books was actually a book by Peter Singer and Otto Sharma called Presence, which specifically talks about this idea of being present in the moment. And, and I do that in so many conscious ways, you know, knowing how active my mind is, I'll go snowboarding because you can think of nothing else, but not dying, which is, you know, definitely makes you present in the moment. Um, much to my wife's dismay, I also spend a lot of time in front of the gaming console because it's a way for me to switch off and just be present. But in terms of someone with a super, super active mind, you know, how do you, I, mean, I, I guess the thing is I, I often catch myself, you know, kind of of seeing a pop-up on the side of the screen and then kind of getting distracted. Are, are there kind of like very simple techniques for like, you know, kind of almost like micro habits for checking your behavior and saying, you know, you're doing it again. Um, you know, so for instance, I give an example. I used to, for many, many years, I used to speak to people and I used to put my hand in front of my mouth and I used to speak like this. And I learned to stop doing it by consciously sitting on my hands for over a year until I stopped the behavior. So I guess the thing is, are there are there kind of similar techniques and tricks that you can use to kind of force yourself to be more conscious and present? There are certainly techniques. I think the 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 one of the things which I love about mindfulness is that it's called a practice. Um, mm -hmm. This is what we're doing all the time. We're practicing it, and there's a lovely thought about this sort of. Um, you can almost describe it as a wheel where we notice that we, so we, we, we may be present. So if we're sitting here now and I guide the practice, I may say, uh, just bring your attention to the contact points of the chair and your feet on the floor. So for a fleeting moment, you notice the contact points of the chair and your feet on the floor. And then suddenly you remember, oh, I'm doing a podcast. Oh, what's my next question? And suddenly your mind's gone. And then you notice, so that's the next point in the wheel, your mind's drifted. And then you notice that your mind has drifted. And that's the moment when you notice that your mind's drifted and then you bring your attention back to the anchor, to the whatever it is that you're choosing to use as the anchor for the meditation. Now this happens so, so much. So I often say that I've been practicing for 12 years-ish and um, I have yet, I think maybe over all of those 12 years, I've had about five minutes of perfect serenity. It's just not my experience. And, and for those that I know, and I know a lot of people who practice mindfulness, they say exactly the same thing. Now, I think there's a huge misconception that we do sit like Yoda, able to sit and just mm. feel the force. That's not been my experience. Um, my experience has been that through practice, I can notice and keep noticing and keep noticing but there's a lovely quote as well which is um uh, mindfulness is easy it's remembering to be mindful that's difficult so how can we bring in those sort of elements and techniques to to remember through the day very simple things you can put a reminder in your calendar you can use any of the number of apps to sort of nudge you and say pause um you can use whatever mechanism you like you put a post-it note in your fridge uh, just to say have you paused today you can use, um, but I, I do often uh, encourage leaders to put something in the diary to say, you know, just a, a five minute slot. And then you can use anything. So, um, you know, I've got a pair of uh, glasses here. You can, you can time yourself for just a minute. So using your phone, just put a timer on and just bring your attention fully to a pair of glasses or a pen or a cup of tea, whatever you like. Because what you're doing in that moment is you're bringing your attention down from one system that's working to the brain in the other. So we spend most of our time in the default network, which is all around um, cognitive reason and, and problem solving. But what we want to bring our attention to is where we are experiencing our senses. And this is, is doing a number of things. It's giving our 
our default network a little bit of a break. It's 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 helping with our well being there, um, and it's it, it it's when we get into our senses that we can actually notice then that our mind is drifting off, and we can bring our attention back to the anchor. And the anchor doesn't matter whether it's a it really doesn't matter in my opinion whether it's a pair of glasses, whether it's the breath, whether it's your beat on the floor, whether it's a bird song, doesn't matter. The only thing that I would say, and I'm often asked, can you use music for mindfulness practice? And I, I would say, absolutely, we can use music for mindfulness practice. I think where I personally have a challenge is where there are lyrics, because just as I've described, if there's a lyric in a song, I will immediately start to respond to the lyric. So I'll start to think cognitively about, oh, do they love them? Do they hate them? Are they going to split up with it? Whatever the lyric is. And so I will start thinking about it. What I want to do is I want to sense and feel into the music. So I think, you know, I think as long as we're careful about our, our lift environment, so if we're jogging, we need to also be cognitive and aware of the road and the traffic and all the rest of it. But I'm a big fan of, of using physical activity as a mindfulness practice as well. And I believe uh, uh, that there were, in, in some Buddhist uh, uh, sort of meth- um, uh, teachings, four ways in which people tended to practice. Uh, one is seated, one is standing, uh, one is lying, and one is walking. So already you see this idea of animation. We don't necessarily have to be sat on a cushion. Uh, to practice. Is it strange that I just imagined a Buddhist on a snowboard being mindful? <laughs> <laughs> I am sure they are there. <laughs> <laughs> um, so so bring it, bring it now back to this concept of, you know, you, you're in a leadership development company and you're, you're training leaders. And I'm, I'm assuming after all of this, that you're using mindfulness as a tool as part of that training, um, that there are there are obviously reasons for that. They're kind of of perceived benefits in in not only teaching people mindfulness, but mindfulness also being a mechanism to to kind of enhance leadership, enhance leadership outcomes, maybe make you, you know, bring that presence into what what you're learning, how you are observing, because you know, what you're what you're essentially applying of your learning, um, which is often in the in the kind of soft skills space, the the most effective way to build mastery is we we have to kind of take this new framework, you know, like communication skills or conflict resolution management, whatever it ends up being as a soft skill, and then we have to apply this framework, and then we kind of get some kind of feedback from the system, and then we have to understand what that feedback means, and we have to adapt our our thinking or understanding of that model and then reapply what is hopefully a better approach the next time. And and I guess that part of mindfulness um, makes you probably a little bit more present and self-aware of of your kind of of impact on others around you because you are mindful of what's happening around you as well. Absolutely. So the way that we describe it in NX Leaders is that they are foundational skills so whatever you are applying whichever system it may be that you want to apply whether it's a coaching skill or whether it's a mediation skill or whether it's a project management skill having the capacity to be fully present in the decision making to be able to be aware of what's happening for you personally but also to be cognizant of other people and to be more aware and alive and alert and awake to them it, it is a complete game changer. So another illustration, we had uh, used to work in an organization which had a meeting, which I think was well meant, not quite sure, but it was uh, had a director's meeting at the start of every Monday, it sort of got everybody together and everybody was saying what the challenges were. Now, in theory, this was a great idea. What you had was people with, you know, uh, obviously integrated delivery, so you're hearing different pieces which were going on and, and, and so you could pick up great ideas and stuff. Because the boss was there, what tended to happen is that a lot of people used it to illustrate just how busy and how erudite they were. And for some reason, I've no idea why, I always sat next to the boss, but the wrong way. So she had a creeping death 
and it always went the wrong way around this very long table, which meant that I had a, about 40 minutes of thinking I have nothing to say. I don't, they're, they're cleverer than me and all the self-doubt that most people experience in life. So I would feel that as it was going around. And as that was building, I would then bring in a practice. So I would bring in, oh, hello, there's those thoughts about self-doubt. There's that sense of fear. And then I'd bring my attention to the body and I'd go, oh, hello, there's that knot in the stomach. There's that dry mouth. And then I'd very gently breathe into that sense of anxiety and use the attention on the breath so that when it came round to my turn to speak, I was calmer, my brain was more engaged, and nine out of ten times I said something sensible and the other time nobody was listening anyway. So it was all fine. But it was a technique to sort of navigate that anxiety, that stress. So in terms of helping me to do my job as a leader, to be present in that meeting, to actually equip myself well, incredibly powerful. If I have an individual, so this is another useful uh, perspective perhaps. If I've just come out of one of those rare meetings where somebody said, Andrew, that's a genius idea. I don't, why, why have we never done this before? We need to do it now and lots of it is brilliant. And I come out and the next thing I see is a member of my team who is clearly distressed about something and has maybe experienced some unacceptable behavior or what have you. And so wants to speak to me. If I'm not able to uh, create a gap between the two activities, am I going to be approaching that person with the right energy? Are they going to feel that I've, mm. they've got my full attention? So being able to be aware of the fact that I'm pumped full of dopamine because I've just had this fantastic, energizing pat on the back from whoever said I'm great, and recognizing that this person actually needs me fully grounded, fully able to be fully present, is, a, is, is the opportunity for me to actually be those things. And so in terms of, if you then translate those two, just in two facets of what it is to be a leader, to turn up and be credible and to be attentive to our team's requirements and to be able to really communicate with people, what a game changer. And so what we try to provide is an insight into what mindfulness is, which we may have just started to scratch the surface of a bit today, and then to provide pragmatic tools which you can take in to uh, your workplace over the week in between the sessions to then practice and rehearse this stuff. And then you come back and we talk about what's worked and what hasn't worked and we keep going. So it's really pragmatic. And, and But for me, this is why we describe it as fan foundational because all the rest of the stuff that we learn as leaders, in my experience, have been enhanced by having that capacity to notice my thoughts bring my attention back to where I want it to be. So you, you just mentioned something that I've, I've always, I've always been curious about, um, as yeah, you, you say that, that, that basic mindfulness is a foundational skill and completely agree. Um, and you've, you've kind of alluded to the way that you, um, essentially maybe teaching is a wrong word, but, but in part your knowledge and wisdom to others is almost through a coaching engagement where you'd have a session and then they would go away for a week and they'd kind of have some, probably some challenges and things to try out, experiment, see how it went, come back, give that feedback, give them the next kind of, of stage in their process and, and continue. How, I mean, what, one of the challenges I've, I've always noticed is that, that there's an inherent lack of safety in sometimes the way that we have to learn. You know, we, we, we often have to learn where the stakes are very high. And some people are very good at laughing at themselves and doing things, you know, that might be perceived as risky, but being okay to kind of accept the, cons the consequences of embarrassment or making a mistake. Other people, not so much. They find it very difficult to try new ideas, experiment with things in new environments. And I, I've, I mean, having done some coaching before, they, they normally look like the people who you say, well, go and try this. And then in the moment they go, yeah, I definitely will. And you come back the next week and go, did you try it? And they go, no. And, and give you kind of a whole bunch of reasons why. Um, now, I mean, thinking of learning and development managers who are working with teams and, and probably dealing with like, you know, interest in mindfulness and, and as a foundational skill, which I agree has a, a profound impact on leadership. 
how how would you go about dealing with those different types of personalities? I mean, I, I don't think the person who's ready to kind of dive and experiment is is that big a challenge, although probably represents a challenge from maybe they've misunderstood and they've just gone and created a dumpster fire in their organization um, versus the other one who's who's kind of so worried about how they're going to be perceived that they almost don't want to experiment. How, how do you deal with safety when you come to getting people to try and implement these skills in their organizations? So I think there's two different things there. There's one trying to bring it as an organizational enterprise. Mm. And I think that is that is uh, high risk and takes a degree of courage. So when I first said to a um, to a more senior manager, to my boss, I want this to be a mindful program, I had already resigned myself to the fact that the answer to that might be, it's been lovely working with you. Thanks so much for your time. Um, and I was in the fortunate position that I could I could say that and take that risk. So I don't think we can uh, or should uh, try to change the culture of an organization lightly. I think we, and that's very much what I talk about in the book, actually, about the, the, the process to try to bring it in at a cultural level. Having said that, if I'm an HR manager and I want to provide training for anybody who is uh, to improve the capabilities of my leadership team, that's a different thing. That's not trying to make it into a mindful organization where you're encouraging the, the, the executive team to start with a short practice you know, or anything as dramatic as that. What you're doing is offering to your leadership team some skills which many, many people will find very interesting. Because the first thing that I, I do if I'm ever teaching a group is to ask people, what sort of experience of mindfulness do we have in the room? Because there are often people who've been practicing for longer than I have. There are often people who've hardly heard the word. So, But you're, you're rarely talking about a completely blank canvas. So, so if a, an HR manager were to say to senior leaders, and this is what we've seen with our clients, when they ask people, would you be interested in, in a mindfulness program which has these results, uh, and we have data on the outcomes of the programs which we've, uh, we've delivered, the, the, there isn't a shortage of people who, who are keen to sign up. So you, you have that energy from people who want to approach this. Um, then in terms of how do you help those people who are on the program, the wonderful thing about mindfulness is nobody needs to know you're doing it. So one of the things which I talk about is how to bring mindfulness into daily life. And we have a series of images on the screen and we talk through how you can do this when you're walking to the tea point, when you're having a cup of tea, when you're holding your glasses. So if you're sitting at a laptop in an open plan studio and you're doing this, you're just looking at your glasses, aren't you? And what I used to do when I used to work in central London, um, and it was quite a stressful commute, I would come in, I would open the laptop, I'd open up my emails, and then I would do a very short three to five minute practice. If anybody was looking over, they'd think I was looking at my emails. They wouldn't think I was practicing mindfulness. So we're not suggesting that people should get a cushion out and start lighting incense. What we're, so there is, it's quite low risk in terms of how you're being perceived. And you can be very subtle about it. So we talk about what works for you. So for some people, they're very happy to sit at their desk with their eyes closed and practice. Fine. I've done that myself. That That's great. If you're in that environment, fantastic. If you're worried that somebody's going to tap you on the shoulder and say, are you having a nap or whatever, then there are other ways that you can practice. You can practice with your eyes open. And you're also talking about during the day, practicing probably for a very short period of time. The rest of it's all internal. It's how you are noticing your thoughts. It's how you're bringing it into the meeting. And then what we're talking about is the techniques which we offer to people enable you to bring it into these practical settings. And what we do is we have a, a session, then normally an hour and a half long session with a group of people where people may be invited to share an exercise which introduces one of the ideas. And we go through these through a series of different themes, whether it's around communication, the perspective that we're taking on issues, a whole range of themes are covered through the uh, seven-week period. And then people are invited to take it into their workplace, but their colleagues won't necessarily know that they're doing anything about mindfulness. But what we often have, and we, ha we have to have this a lot, is team uh, the participants in the program 
saying to us, my team said that I was so much more attentive. Normally about week three, week four. Mm. And so people see the consequences, but as I say, they're not the, the risk to them is fairly low. And final question before we start to close off is is I'm I'm curious to know if there's there's any kind of data on the the kind of the new way we work. You know, the work is now tending to move towards remote and hybrid. People are spending more time behind a computer screen, much like we are. Um, having conversations with with each other where you're not present, body language is not necessarily kind of of a contributing factor, which which might contribute or might assist in the mindfulness. Because when you're engaging with the person in a physical kind of present situation, you you probably tend to be more uh, at risk, like more present in that conversation. Not necessarily, but I'm just wondering with whether you've noticed with companies that are are working more remote, you're working more hybrid, that you know, they're starting to see any any data that would suggest, well, maybe mindfulness is a very important tool in those organizations to kind of create that that communication which is normally under strain in those type of environments. Um or or whether not. Um whether actually um you have to be less mindful when you're working remotely or it doesn't matter. I'm just curious as to where there's any correlations there. I don't know about the data, I'm afraid. I haven't got, my, uh, I haven't got any data to hand on that. My sense is that the, the lockdowns and the pandemics encouraged us, or a lot of us, to be very much more aware of our mental health and well-being. And there was a lot of talk about things like mindfulness, awareness of nature, and other things that could help us through what was a very, very difficult time. I'm fascinated by how little people talk about the pandemic. Um, and, you know, having been through that shocking period, how little we actually still talk about it now, I'm sure there's a there's a book about that. Um, in terms of my own personal take on it, working remotely makes mindfulness so much more, even more relevant because for some people, yes, I think they probably feel like we are, we're very much engaged in a one-on-one -on -one conversation. I have yet to master the art of following the chat and listening to anybody who's speaking. Mm. I, I can't do it. And and yet there is this this almost, I find it quite rude, this perception that it's fine to say something in the chat. I won't raise my hand and ask to be part of the conversation. I'll just raise something in the chat and expect it to be answered. And it, I find that really abrupt and really uh, quite hostile. But it's very conventional and I get that. But for me, the, the thing which is wrong with that or the thing which I struggle with with that is my attention is on everybody in this room. So if you now start shouting over here, I remember ages ago, somebody talking about telephones, old school telephones. And they said, it's so weird, isn't it? Because if you're in an office and the phone goes, somebody says, I'm sorry, I'll just better take this. But if I walked past that person's desk with a bell, they wouldn't immediately go, oh, sorry, I've got to talk to the person with the bell. They, they go, would you put the bell down? You know, And so this idea of being distracted is made worse, I think, in a virtual environment because we've got so many distractions. And also I can put my camera off and you have no idea what I'm doing, whether I'm listening to you or not. And so the the reality is, I think, that the culture of mindfulness, attentiveness, communication, kindness to each other becomes even more important when we're dealing with so much less information as we are on a 2D screen than in person. Oh. There's a... The, the the point about the chat window and the and the actual yeah video windows is actually a really really interesting one i never actually thought about that so i think it's a practice that we've become so used to um and we've we've stopped actually thinking about the implication and and you're so right i mean i i i when we when we when it started i often used to realize i hadn't paid attention to the chat window and now, the moment I see that little red indicator to say someone's, you know, you go open the chat window and, and you immediately become disengaged from the conversation because you're reading what's happening on the side. So, listen, like, I think that's a really valuable lesson I'm going to take away from this is to be kind of, of more aware of that type of behavior um, and the implications it has on, on people's ability to be present and actively listen to what others are saying. Um, right, so 
two questions I always ask towards the end of these. Um, the first is basically on the topic of Buddhist ninjas and Jedi Knights. Um, would would be that if you know if we we've we've established that mindfulness is a foundational skill, and that the benefit of of people being mindful is that they're more present, and as a result of that, they're more self aware, and as a result of that, they are probably more effective learners. But now, if if you were an HR, a learning and development manager inside an organization. I would probably guess that mindfulness is not necessarily very high on your radar. And if I were to to kind of further that, you know, the one of the things we do is we look a lot at, you know, kind of of um, the World Economic Forum and PwC and, and Gartner and all of these things and what they're saying about the industry. And, and it's really interesting that things like adaptability, communication, creativity are all the things that are dominating the conversation. And as part of this, I thought, why have I never seen mindfulness on any of those documents or those reports, which is fascinating, because it is actually quite a foundational skill. So the question would be, if, if you were essentially a learning and development manager, an HR manager, and, and you listened to this podcast and you thought, wow, mindfulness sounds really interesting, and I'd love to implement it in my organization. Um, you know, kind of of short of reading this incredible book called Organizational Mindfulness, a how-to guide, um, the, the the question I would have is, how would you go about navigating that? You know, how would you go about influencing and getting people on board with with that, that kind of, of approach? You know, how do I get mindfulness awareness into the organization? How do I get people to buy into it? Absolutely. Well, I think... One thing you can you can get an expert to come in and talk to people, talk to you, bring some data um, to give you that argument to build the case for why would you why would you want to to invest in this? And I think it's really important that you choose a, a credible uh, trainer who's going to be used to the corporate environment if that's your environment. So you want somebody who's going to speak candidly clearly and effectively to people who are probably some of whom will be skeptical but don't overestimate how skeptical people might be i think that the 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 idea of mindfulness in one way or another is very uh, standard now people one one of the things i used to say was my kids didn't hear about mindfulness from me they heard about it from school and my kids are now just at the point where they're going to enter the workplace so Lots of people leaving university are coming into the workplace expecting to see the well-being program, the mindfulness program, the skills which are foundational made available to them. So I think there might be a certain degree of skepticism among some of, some of us expecting to find a really hard battle to, to win. And actually, people might be a lot more amenable to it than one expects. But I think it's key to get a, a good expert who can, who can uh, talk to you, uh, follow your case, um, find a credible uh, uh, supplier who can who can provide this for your workforce, and then use the data. So, if you want it to be a rolling program, what we've done in Alex Leaders is create a pretty robust uh, survey process. So, with each course, we build up more data about what's the outcome, what what's actually changed for these people in terms of their awareness and well being, and so. And is this data um, visible anywhere? Can people go and, and see these stats and metrics? Absolutely. They can reach out to us and we can provide them for them. Brilliant. Okay. Final question then is we always ask our guests um, on our podcast to share a recent podcast or book or a something that they've um, essentially consumed, whether that be audio, visual, or experiential, but just something that has had a profound impact on them, a change their their kind of views about something, made them go, aha, um, so what, what springs to mind for you? So I don't know if this counts, <laughs> but I'll give it a go. So I have recently moved to the South Coast um, where um, I, I was describing before the podcast. 
And I live near a place called Dungeness, which is a very dramatic uh, landscape. Uh, it's, it's um, I believe, I believe it is nitty ditty Yoda impression. Uh, I believe it is the only desert in the UK because it's got a microclimate and doesn't rain very much. Um, and I was sitting there at sunset a couple of months ago, having just moved down here, and there was a reflection of the sunset on the stones. It's a pebbly beach, in essence. And the redness of those stones and the redness of the sky was incredibly odd, very strange, had not experienced it for a very long time. And the reason I share that as a particularly affecting moment is one of the things I've noticed moving out of London, which is very, very human dominated, very, very uh, busy urban environment, to somewhere which is much more nature focused and in, in the country with environments and experiences like that, is just the, the sort of realization again, something which I think I've probably lost track of since I was a child, of how magnificent nature is and how wonderfully refreshing and um, encouraging it is to be in it. Um, and yeah, so not the words of somebody, but the effect of nature, perhaps. That was exceptional. Um, and I think a great example of, of being present in the moment and, and appreciating that where, yeah, others probably wouldn't. So, um, great way to to close the circle is if you can learn mindfulness and be present um the world and and nature have some incredible things to show you andrew it's been an absolute pleasure it's been a wonderful conversation i thoroughly enjoyed it learned a lot i'll actually be taking some of the tips and techniques that you shared with me personally into um, the office tomorrow so the rest of my team had best watch out um but thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Jason. It's been great. Hey, thanks so much for joining us for this episode of Impact Learning Visionaries. If you found it interesting or helpful, please subscribe by clicking on the button down below so you don't miss our next one. Also, be sure to check out our Reality Bytes blog for more information on how technology is aiding in learning development. Links are all in the description below. Go check it out. Thanks a lot. Bye.